The Lord be with you. Oh, you guys sound really strong this morning. That's great to see everybody. And the lilies showed up uh, last week. They weren't quite ready to open up, but uh, there they are. They're beautiful. I don't know what the trick was, but they're doing great today. I don't know if they'll stick around for the whole Easter season, but we got seven weeks of Easter, and then uh, Pentecost is the, kind of the next big thing, so uh, we'll see how long they last. If you did uh, bring one yourself and you'd like to take it, feel free. And uh, also, we'll see who we can recruit to get those flowers down to. I think they're past their prime. <laughs> well, uh, we'll begin with uh, another uh, Easter, nice Easter hymn, and uh, the greeting, He is risen. Let us rise, please, and we'll sing our opening hymn. God bless your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You Show us your steadfast love, O Lord. And your salvation. Let us then confess our sins unto our gracious Lord. Almighty God. God has promised his merciful forgiveness to those who repent of their sins and turn to him in confession. By your faith in Jesus and for his sake, all your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning. On this uh, second Sunday of Easter, our first reading comes to us from the fourth chapter of Acts, beginning at verse number 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There is not a needy person among them, for as many were as owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes to us from 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise in honor of our risen Lord Jesus for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated for our hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is a strange question to ask in church, I know, but here goes. Are there any horror movie fans out there? Okay. Uh, And if you're not a fan of the films, that's okay, but do you remember at least when you and your friends used to tell the scary stories around the campfire back in the earlier days of your youth. I remember those scary stories. And I ran across the world's shortest horror story ever. It's only two sentences. Maybe you heard of it. Published in 1948 by author Frederick Brown from Cincinnati. Here's the whole two-sentence story. The last man on earth sat alone in a room there was a knock on the door. (laughs) That's not bad, right? I kind of like it. An ominous knock at the door. Who would that be? Well, knock was the simple title that fits quite well with such a short story, knock. Well, a knock at the door can sometimes be a very scary situation, depending on who you're expecting or not expecting. Now, I think the disciples that we find in our gospel lesson this morning, I think they can relate all too well to the frightening sound of a knock at the door. That's where we find them on the evening of our Lord's resurrection behind locked doors. 
verse 19 says, for fear. They were afraid that what they witnessed happen to their beloved teacher, Jesus, might also be coming upon them next. Will they too be crucified? Will they be interrogated, beaten, and scourged? They certainly did not want to find out. They didn't want to hear any sound coming from their front door. No sound at all. Well, you remember the scene. Jesus didn't need to make any sound at all, did he? He just showed up right there in the, in the midst of them. Without any of those ghostly sounds accompanying his arrival, no latch breaking on the door, no creaky door opening sounds, he showed up even without wearing any chains, unlike Scrooge's friend, Jacob Marley, you recall. Although notably, Jesus did have still the marks of his sufferings in his hands and in his side. The very first words that he spoke to his Disciples were words of pure comfort that were gladly received. Peace be with you. That's from our gospel account in John's gospel. Now what's interesting, given our readings throughout these seven weeks of this uh, new Easter season we've started, what's interesting is, first of all, our Old Testament readings have given way to excerpts from the book of Acts instead. And there in the Acts of the Apostles, When you lay down, for example, today's passages in Acts, uh, side by side next to our gospel reading, by comparison, you'll quickly observe that the disciples, now called apostles or sent, sent out ones, they are by contrast bold and out there bearing witness to Christ in the book of Acts and nothing like the huddled fear mongers that we first see behind locked doors there in our gospel reading from John. So the question becomes then, wow, what a difference. What accounts for such a drastic transformation? And then secondly, where can you and I get a dose of that bravery boost? Well, that's really going to be the theme throughout this whole Easter tide then, as expressed in one way or by one apostle or another. Paul, Peter, Philip, and we'll go through it. Today we're going to take the approach of clicking an imaginary link, if you will, found in Acts chapter 4 and verse 33 specifically. That's the one printed on the back of your bulletin, which was our original Acts reading, verse 33 there. It doesn't specify any which apostle that's being spoken about there. It only makes a general comment, verse 33, about this transformation that we're talking about. Uh, essentially, it's a transla- transformation from mouse to martyr. And by martyr, I mainly mean what the original Greek word meant, and that is witness. The word martyr originally meant a witness or one who testifies. But extra biblical history itself testifies to many, many witnesses willingly going all the way to their death rather than stop bearing witness to their Savior, Jesus Christ. So we want to explore then, why? Why were these witnesses so willing to sacrifice themselves as Jesus did to get their message out, even if it, became, um, if it came to be becoming a martyr like the modern sense in which we're accustomed to the word, one who dies for their faith? So get ready with me then uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And it says this right there. With great power, the apostles in general were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. So we click that verse today and it takes us to the Apostle Paul. And it prints out for us a nice convenient yellow insert that's in your bulletin. So that's where we'll spend the rest of the time mostly uh, from that insert there from a very exciting chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. And this is where we find that Paul is no longer referred to as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And more importantly than just that, he's no longer going around murdering Christians like he did the deacon Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So that's certainly a significant transformation in Paul, I I think we can agree. Let me get directly to that explanation for Saul's transformation to Paul, 
or his rebirth. It's not incorrect to say. His rebirth now as God's apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is now quite frequently on the receiving end of those brutal beatings by the Jews and by some Gentiles as well who are persecuting outspoken Christians like Paul and like his fellow church planting team, his missionary team. But what accounts for Paul's 180 degree turnaround? Well, two things. The first one, Paul himself encountered the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, like the other disciples, even Thomas eventually. For Paul, however, instead of encountering the risen Lord Jesus behind some locked doors, Paul went face to face actually with the post-ascended Lord Jesus, this Jesus who came back and made a special appearance just for Paul, then Saul, and it was all happening right out there on the open road, the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. So this reminds us, for um, one thing, one can encounter Jesus anywhere. Uh, That's in one sense, at least. But as Jesus did so with uh, a couple other disciples, from Emmaus, you might recall Cleopas, and then that poor unnamed other guy. <laughs> he never has a name assigned to him. But we see there that Jesus chooses to reveal himself to them in the breaking of the bread. And that is in the sacrament, through his word that he shares. So those two Emmaus disciples had said to one another, did not our hearts burn within when he opened to, to us the scriptures on the way? It was mainly through the spoken word also to Saul that Jesus brought out the Paul in Paul, if you uh, know what I mean there. It was mainly through the spoken word because, as you might recall, what Jesus did on the road to Damascus was blind Saul. So uh, effectively, that's all Saul could do to anyone is hear them. He couldn't see them. So he heard the spoken word. But for Paul, that was enough. It was enough for Saul's to Paul's radical transformation. And I might add, it's enough for us to hear the word of the Lord today and to receive his sacraments. It's just that same living and active word which makes the miracle of baptism, that sacrament. Uh, It's not the water, but rather it's the productive, potent, powerful, authentic, authoritative word of God combined with the water that brings about the new birth at baptism. And so it is with communion. It's the word that Jesus instituted that brings the sacramental union of his body and blood to us to nourish our faith, to strengthen and sustain us. It's God's word and sacrament. Okay, secondly, I mentioned up top there are two things that account for the Apostle Paul's 180 degree turnaround. The first is God's appointed means of grace that we talked about. The second thing that accounts for not just Paul's transformation, mind you, but all the apostles, all the disciples, and all the followers of Christ down through the ages, right down to you and me. This second thing actually is not even a thing, but a who. And I'm talking, of course, about the Holy Spirit. Now, we saw this in connection with Jesus sending the 11 who were huddled behind locked doors. Now, when you have 11 men involved in a huddle, yes, it might stir your brain right over to the NFL. And here's my dreaded dad joke for the day, all right? Just to get it out of the way. These were NFL, not fierce leaders, all right? Until verse 22 says, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Then, and only then, were they all emboldened to face the lions and the chief priests. That kind of works, right? Those are football teams, I hope you got. But here's the best of all of it. And there's no joking about this part. The very next verse in John's Gospel, verse 23, defines exactly what these spirit-anointed, spirit-filled, sent-out ones were to do with all that spirit power and authority that Jesus gave them with the Holy Spirit. Verse 23 says exactly what they are to do. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. 
Now that's some serious business. That is facing down demons. That's facing down our monstrous sins and freeing people from that bondage, delivering people from evil and delivering to them the goods of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Because, as Luther liked to put it, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. And we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about forever and being delivered by those who witness to Christ, even today, even now, as we did in our words of absolution earlier. It is as deliverable today in Christ's church as it was when Christ first instituted his appointed means and said with all the authority of his mighty words, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So now we know what's at stake with those sent out as witnesses to the authoritative word that was entrusted to them by the Lord himself. Now we know what's in the balance out there too. Men's souls, their very souls, and the eternal destinies of their entire households, women and children as well as men. People whose past ignorance was formerly overlooked, as it says there in Acts 17. But now, quote, God commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given full assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So this is then what motivated the new Paul, then caring for those who were presently bound for destruction and wanting to intercede for them. This from the one who in his former life now, you recall, would not even sit at the same table as a Greek individual, as a Gentile dog. Now, the new St. Paul, or Sent Paul, ascends the Areopagus, and right there in Acts 17. He ascends to speak their Greek language, to learn and even quote their own Greek poets, in order to make a compelling, relatable presentation to their Greek mind of their so-called unknown God, uh, their hedge, their bets deity, I like to call it. It's just in case among their many polytheistic idols, they accidentally missed one, the unknown God. The whole hill on which these philosophically minded Greeks and even some foreigners would, quote, spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new, their ancient coffee shop, if you will. It was called the Areopagus. Now that means Mars Hill. Mars was the Latin equivalent of Ares, who was the Greek god of war. So here's Paul. He's tolerating this idolatrous setting, this idolatrous center, really, to indeed engage in spiritual battle on that war hill. Paul was willing to do all this because the stakes, again, were men's souls. Eternal destinies were hanging in the balance. Now that, to Paul, was worth a few snickers that he would receive. It was worth some mockery, even, when he brought up the cornerstone of our Christian faith, namely, Christ was delivered over to our death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That's how Paul put it to the Romans in chapter 4 there. Paul got mocked for that because that is sheer folly to the Greek. Every thinking Greek knew that resurrecting crude, corrupt, confining flesh, that was doing things backwards because releasing the physical body was the soul's flight to freedom and spiritual fortune, uh, fortune rather. Flesh, they saw it as bad, spirit, good. Sometimes Christians, we use the similar terms here, but please understand the crucial difference. The Greek mind is speaking not so much of flesh as in our corrupt hearts that need to be redeemed. No, they and many today still adhere to this false teaching uh, about the physical body being the entrapment of the soul and that body is inherently evil, the physicality of it, inherently evil. Uh, Not like 
we understand God made the physical body and said it was good, right? Like C.S. Lewis put it, God likes matter. He invented it. So good to the Greek is living in a different state of existence in the spirit realm. And so this progression, as they see it, may or may not have anything to do necessarily with guilty vices or corrupt minds and souls and bodies. Furthermore, the progression may also be divorce, uh, necessarily, of, of putting on any virtue in place of the vices. So if you're a greeting glutton, for example, you may nevertheless still graduate out of your physical body and float ethereally above the lower material realm with the whole while your gluttonous, greedy character completely intact. You're just going to weigh less. And I suppose for some that is one idea of heaven. Today, a form of this kind of morally unaccountable progression of spirit is known as Gnosticism. Some of you may have heard of that word. And it's the kind of dangerous, ungrounded thinking that Paul was warning these Athenian philosophers about. Now, in contrast to this Greek picture of the afterlife, Christ taught, and the Christian church confesses, quote, I believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That's salvation, purchased and won by our crucified and resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is most certainly worth contending for on Mars Hill, Venus Avenue, or anywhere our feet may tread on planet Earth, because where our blessed Creator and Redeemer is not yet confessed as Lord, there the Spirit is sending any and all who will testify to his glorious name. Now that's a knock on the door. I pray we'll all answer. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, coincidentally and conveniently, we have a creed right here on page 8 that we can confess. Not the Apostles' Creed, but the Nicene Creed on this communion Sunday. So please rise as we make profession of our faith together. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Now he will come again with glory to judge the both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we continue our worship with the offering.
Please rise for the offertory. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with your pure milk of your word, that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, grant to those ordained for your service the gift of the Spirit, we pray, wisdom that comes down from above, and grace to faithfully fulfill the all their holy callings where you have placed them. Lord, in your mercy. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Build up the households of your people that your holy children, begotten in baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy. You have instituted authorities to carry out your justice. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your goodwill. Lord, in your mercy. As your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, give your presence and comfort also to the troubled in our midst, we pray. Comfort all those who weep, those who mourn, those who are lonely, those who are ailing. Comfort them with the blessed joy of Eastern morning's message. Lord, in your mercy. Father of the risen Christ, you have given us the crucified and risen body and blood of our Lord in this holy supper. Let us taste that the Lord is good indeed and continually grow up into salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the blessed sacraments that through them we may have comfort, forgiveness of sins, and grant us also your Holy Spirit that we may heartily believe your word and through the holy sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have brought to earth the brightness of your heavenly kingdom. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please rise for the post-communion canticle. give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. The bless, Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace. Maybe see it for our closing hymn.
It's a nice closing hymn. I like that one. But we're not done singing yet because I got a little note here. It says, there's a birthday. And I think it's Nancy Nipstadt, right? Am I right? There she is. That's the age we'll be in heaven forever and ever. That's a good age. Um, Let's see. Our hardworking elders are moving ahead with the call process uh, once again. And they had one interview yesterday already, so that's under the belt. And now um, we're looking forward to some other ones. Did you want to add to that, Blaine? Or are you good? Well, we've received uh, a couple other names from the district that we're pursuing to see if they are possibly um, interested in considering a call. And they also recommended that we revisit some of the uh, pastors in the past list since it's been a couple of years since we started this. Their situations may change. So we're reaching out to them to see if their situation has changed that they may consider a call. Um, don't know if there's got timeline. Probably a couple months we'll have another meeting just kind of estimating and uh, see where we go from there. David. I made an announcement uh, a while ago for the Wife for Life. Uh, they have a Hope for Healing gender conference. Sexuality is a gift integral to our understanding of self and essential in our service to neighbor. Sexuality is designed to be a blessing, but what happens when the gift, because of sin, is broken? How do we respond to gender brokenness in ourselves, our loved ones, and our neighbors? We offer hope. So uh, the conference is down here at uh, Concordia in uh, Irvine, and it's only $40 for adults, $20 for youth. You can find more information at y4life.org. And uh, they did extend the um, uh, sign-ups for it, so it's still available to go, and that's a lot closer than the next thing I'm announcing, which is the Issues Etc. Conference. That is in at the uh, Concordia University of Chicago. That is Friday, July 12th, Saturday, July 13th. Uh, the speakers will be Riley Gaines. She's the swimmer that uh, is also standing up for uh, uh, gender and uh, women's sports. Um, Mark and Molly Hemingway will be there. Um, Aaron Wren, Chris Roseborough, Brian Wolfmiller, and Will Whedon will be leading the, um, uh, the hymn sing. Uh, That's a a really awesome Christian Lady Conference to attend. I'd highly recommend going, despite myself never having been. Um, But, you know, maybe we can go. Maybe I can go. They're already up to 200 out of the 500 slots. And after they sell out that 500, sometimes they'll add an extra 50, maybe. So, anyway, good good stuff around. Yes, and even closer than all that, uh, those are good announcements, but... Something you can just drive to on a Sunday afternoon. I'm talking about April 21st. The glitches are opening up. There are floral gardens. Once again, they're in bloom. Very pretty. There's going to be tea and all sorts of good stuff. Last time we went, we had a great time. So that's the 21st, two weeks from today, between 1 and 4 o'clock. Put that on your calendar. And uh, anything else? Then the uh, Spirit of God. Go- oh, sorry, Sharon, go ahead. Very nice. Good. All right. Well, go in the love of Christ, fellowship of the Spirit. God bless. Mm-hmm.